In this next session of the Widening the Pipeline training, we're going to talk about the need for more people of color covering finance in journalism. It's a potent uh, subject because finance and, and all of the things that come along with it are integral to every beat that we would cover. And we're joined today for this discussion by Stacey Marie is Ishmael. Hi. She is the uh, managing editor for crypto mm -hmm. for Bloomberg. You got a reading list from me uh, last week, and on it was a link to a conversation that Stacy and Jacqueline and other folks from Bloomberg had about this. But I wanted to start before Stacy gets into her presentation by uh, revisiting one of the most powerful elements of that discussion that I thought. And that was as a young, I guess as a college student even, you began to see what knowing about finance and having that literacy and having that familiarity with uh, money and finance meant uh, as a student. So can you start us off with that and lead us to your, your path to becoming a financial journalist? Sure. So for some context, I went to the London School of Economics for undergrad, did not study economics, studied, did one year of econ, and then was like, there's way more math than I was expecting it to be, I'm good. Um, but my major was in international relations with a lot of telling myself that I was going to go into like law or consulting or something like that. And what was interesting about LSE was that it was my first profound set of daily interactions with wealth which is a very different thing from how I grew up. So I, I grew up in the Caribbean. I got to go to LSE because I won a scholarship, which essentially meant like being extremely nerdy for seven straight years and beating a bunch of other people in high school on lots of tests. And I was on a fixed stipend that covered, you know, most but not all of my expenses. I lived on the halls of residence. I waited anxiously every quarter for my stipend check to be deposited so I could figure out if I was gonna like buy food or books or you know pick another thing that was not compatible with all of the above. And I was surrounded for the first time by people whose parents bought them apartments and who took cabs to class and who seemed to be on a path to become investment bankers from the day they walked through the doors of what we call the old building while i was like what is an investment banker and you know i my, my parents are relatively well educated my father is a petrochemical engineer my mother worked in banking um as a kind of a, a commercial banker and somebody who focused on making small business loans to people in like farmers and people who needed, you know, money to buy a plot of land to grow vegetables on, which is a different universe entirely from working for Goldman Sachs and structuring deals. And so by about halfway through my first year of undergrad, I realized that I needed to have a better grip on money. And I needed to have a better grip on how money seemed to lubricate everything around me. Like, how is it some of my classmates paid their rent for the dorms that they lived in in straight cash <laughs> that they kept in chests underneath their, um, their bed? Which is this one particularly suspicious character. But this, this is a real thing that did happen. Happened while I queued up in NatWest, like begging them not to put my accounts in overdraft because I like bought lunch before the stipend check had cleared. And throughout this, you know, voyage of discovery, shall we say, I started reading two newspapers at the same time, fully newspapers in print. This was whatever it was that I was going to get. Um, and one of them was the Financial Times and the other was The Guardian. And you could not pick two more opposite media organizations to inform like your daily media diet, right? So the front page of the FT would be Marks and, Marks and Spencer share price rises 20 pence or 
whatever the thing is, Marks and Spencer being at the time one of the largest retailers in the UK, and the front page of The Guardian might be something like um, Marks and Spencer's employees concerned about cost of living. And so there was just a very different perspective on the types of stories that were covered and the types of story and the types of angles that made it to the front pages. Now, both the FT and the, and the Guardian cost 20 pence a day, which I could super afford even on, even on that site then. And I made a real habit of reading both of them. But even though I was kind of, you know, this was my daily media diet, it never occurred to me that I could be one of the people writing stories like that. And the way that I got into finance journalism was almost accidentally in that, you know, I was, as I said at the beginning, I thought I was going to work in law or consulting, partly because I needed somebody to sponsor a visa and lawyers and consultants are like very organized when it comes to immigration. But that was like, you know, like what I was interested in. I like, I like solving problems. I like presenting information. I like doing analysis. But I was freelancing because I was on a fixed income. And I worked for a small publisher, a specialist publisher, that created media in the form of print magazines, again, a long time ago, for people who had different sorts of underrepresented backgrounds. So it was like career magazines for brown and black people, career magazines for LGBTQ students, career magazines for students with disabilities. And so part of my job, which was super fun, was to just go around the city of London and interview people from those types of backgrounds who had big fancy jobs in big fancy places and write about how they got them. And one of the last interviews that I did in my final year of undergrad was with someone who worked at Pearson, which at the time owned the Financial Times, and he was one of their top people in terms of um, what in the UK is called BAME recruiting, Black and Minority Ethnic Recruiting. And so we had this whole conversation and he was like, so what do you want to do? And I gave him the spiel, I was like, I'm going to go work for McKinsey, it seems fine. And he's like, well, have you considered journalism? I was like, no. <laughs> like, you are literally doing an interview with me right now for a, for a journalism product. I was like, yeah, it's completely unrelated. And so he told me about the um, a program at the Financial Times called a graduate traineeship, which is kind of like an accelerated internship. And I was like, okay, sure, cool, I'll check it out. And of course, you know, as an undergrad, I like glued. And then by the time I got around to it, I was like, ah, oh, the deadline is like three days from now. And I rapidly tried to do, pull this, you know, fairly substantial application together. I was so close to the deadline that I had to hand deliver it to the offices of the Financial Times because I could not be sure that if I put it in a post box, it would get there by the deadline, and journals and internships do take deadlines seriously, as you might imagine. And then they didn't call me for like months. So, you know, I'm doing exams, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my life, I'm continuing the interviews with management consultancy programs, and then they call me back, and I go through this interview process, and it's super interesting, and I get to talk to Lionel Barber, who at the time was like the absolute top editor of the Financial Times. And remember, I had been reading the FT like religiously, for years at this point. And I was like, dude, why is your coverage of the Caribbean so bad? Now, this is not the kind of thing that you should ordinarily lead your questions to the editor in chief of the media organization that you're trying to work for with, but I, nobody told me I didn't. So, and he laughed, which was merciful of him. And it led to kind of a spirited conversation around the fact that, you know, for the FT's audience, the Caribbean was a tourism destination, and they were interested in, you know, the hurricanes and the beaches and the whatever fancy hotel is being built, but the debt capital markets and the, the equity capital markets, two words about the time I had like, I was like, oh, yes, I did study those words, um, weren't interesting enough for them to be investable. And, you know, this was, this was like a throwaway comment from a very busy person in the context of a much broader conversation, but it sort of radicalized me in the sense of like, first of all, my country is very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, but I was like, huh, I'm sure that there are more stories to tell than what the next sandals is being built and where and why you should think about it for a weekend getaway. And I hope I get this job because I think that, you know, who has money and who has power is one of the most interesting things you could talk about in journalism. And that was the beginning of my final journalism career. What an incredible example of the power of lived experience. 
and what we miss out in on so many sectors of journalism when we don't have people of color involved. So on that note, let me let you take it away. So most of this presentation is going to be a series of quotes from people I, I respect, or at least find interesting. Uh, I'll call you the ones I respect. In, in journalism that will kind of inform the backdrop to why I think you should care and why I think you should think about business and finance and even economic journalism in the whatever paths you follow. And I want to preface this by saying you can be a business journalist without working at Bloomberg or the FT or the Wall Street Journal or, you know, business journalism is just telling stories about how the world works through a financial and economic lens. And you can do that no matter what your beat is. If you are covering technology, then you should know how the tech companies that you're covering make money or plan to make money, who their investors are, um, what the timelines are for when they need to raise money again if they're backed by venture capital. If you cover social justice, then you need to understand budgets and donors and fundraising and who is backing which kinds of initiatives that might be making their way through you know the state legislature that you're responsible for and who the donors and the lobbyists are that are backing those pieces of legislation and where they get their money from if you cover health health is like 100 percent a money story like how insurance works or does not work depending on your perspective um, how, you know, what the business model is, why it is. I think ProPublica just had a story a couple of days ago about doctors at Cigna who can, you know, deny claims in under two seconds. Like, why is insurance set up and incentivized to have not providing care be the business model? Like, why, why are so many rural hospitals in places like Texas, even prior to the abortion ban, closing down, right? Like, why are people being left to drive 40 minutes to an hour at a time to get to the closest trauma center or the next best operating room? These are all financial stories. Um, if you cover entertainment, I personally play a lot of video games. And the way that I justify this is by saying that video games is one of the largest asset classes in the world. And from a revenue perspective, it's bigger than TV and movies combined. So me playing video games is my job. Um, this is what I tell my friends. And but you know, if you if you care about something, if there's anything in the world that you are interested in, there is a monetization angle to that thing most often, whether you want there to be or not, folks have to figure out how to make things sustainable. And if you're trying to figure out how to make things sustainable, then you're trying to figure out who gets to decide what counts as sustainable. This is a quote from a person named Heather Bryant, who I actually respect tremendously. And I first met her during a fellowship program at Stanford University. And she, at the time, was one of what I consider to be very few people who was talking about the missing perspective of people who actually grew up in rural areas and had the ability to make media about and from that perspective. And Heather is a wonderful photographer as, as well as a reporter, as well as a software engineer, like it's just sort of terrifyingly competent uh, combination of things. And she was also just one of the people who like really, you know, to Rachel's earlier point, represented to me how many different kinds of voices are not present in most newsrooms and in most media organizations. And I think about what Heather said here in this quote a lot, which is, to pretend power and influence has nothing to do with our work. The work of journalism is to be recklessly naive about how the world works and how journalism plays a role in enabling or exposing how power is wielded in our societies. Now, I have lived in more countries and states than most people, but um, partly because I have a very short attention span and partly because I have a weirdly high tolerance for risk. And so, <laughs> much to the chagrin of my parents. Um, so I have worked in, I have lived and worked in New York, I have lived and worked in Silicon Valley, I have spent a lot of time in countries outside of the United States, obviously in the UK, but also in Europe. And in each one of the cities and places that I've lived and worked in, I always try to figure out like who has the power. And when I was working in Northern California in the tech industry, it was very much like big tech and venture capitalists. 
But when I'm, the, you know, so if people were having conversations in a bar, it would always be about like, what's Mark Andreessen up to? Did you see what Salesforce did? You go, I would go see my friends in LA and it would be the studios and agents and people working in film. Um, in New York, it's a little bit more complicated. In DC, well, guess who? It's like politicians and lobbyists, right? And why is that? Because like, these are the people who drive the economies of those places. So if you are in the Caribbean, so I grew up in Trinidad, you know, for a long time, it was the oil companies um, or the folks who, you know, had control over the natural gas wells um, or the folks who ran the refinery. And now it's increasingly kind of like manufacturing. And again, like that's, that's all about money. It's all about power. And so one of the things that you should be thinking about, again, whether you define yourself as a business or journalist or not, is who is making the decisions behind the stuff that you are writing about, right? You always want to go back um, a couple of steps. And that sense of perspective is often implicit in the choices that we make about what we cover, what we cover, but also what doesn't get covered. And so I go back to the example of the difference between the coverage in the FT, which I thought was outstanding, um, except for the German stuff, and the coverage in The Guardian, which was often like quite good. And I think about this quote, which is from um, T. Gentleman, who wrote a book called The Elements of Journalism. There's an updated one that my copy is from 2007. That said, the earliest journalists firmly established as a core principle their responsibility to examine unseen corners of society. There's a phrase that people use about journalism that I really, really dislike, which is that we give voice to the voiceless. And the reason that I really dislike it is because like, I'm like, like, no, we fucking don't. We elevate voices. Like, we, like, we, like, it's not that people were standing there not saying anything the whole time until we showed up with a notebook and a camera. Um, it's that people, they didn't necessarily have a megaphone, right? And like, we can provide a megaphone. And so I had a similarly sort of allergic reaction the first time I read this quote. Because I get it, right? Like, yes, our job is to excavate and to find and to reveal and to discover. But I don't think that this quote was written from the perspective of people like us. Because what a lot of folks in news just think of as unseen, we just think of as like our neighborhood or our families or the schools we went to. But like, this is where we live. Like, yeah, like, you know, people are like, oh, have you heard about this thing? Like, yes, this is, this is what we live all the time. Um, random tangent. You know, when I first moved to New York, like nobody ate oxtail other than Caribbean people, and now it's in Whole Foods and very expensive. And like that, <laughs> I don't even get started. And so, like, you know, and so it's like the like the gentrification of food, right, and how that affects prices and affordability. And if you grew up eating things like ghee or using coconut oil and buying those things relatively cheaply and accessibly, but now it's like $8.99 in Whole Foods and it's organic, and your ability to buy those things is compromised because you know folks realize it's more profitable to rebrand the stuff that you were using all the time and like have it be featured in the food section of the New York Times. Like That's a business journalism story, but it's a business journalism story, but it takes a very particular set of you know, overlapping experiences, cultural competencies, sourcing to be able to deliver well. Now, um, I am very bad at following rules, which is an interesting thing to be an editor <laughs> and now have to set rules for a whole bunch of people. But I realized that over time, one of my favorite things about being as a business journalist is you get access to a heroic amount of information. And public, publicly traded companies, so a company that is listed on a stock exchange, have to declare basically everything that they're doing all the time, including the salaries of their biggest executives, um, where they are operating, what countries they are operating in, they have to reveal if there have been any kinds of like material breaches, if they get hacked. And so if you're the kind of person that hates when people won't answer your questions, business journals is amazing. You don't even have to talk to people, you can just read stuff that they literally are legally obliged to disclose all day long. And you can go to them and be like, I note here in this footnote <laughs> to this filing that you have published 
that you can do these kinds of things. And this is this is great for my personality because unlike in many other types of journalism where you might hear the phrase, oh, they want to maintain access or, you know, they weren't given access. They didn't get the interview. There was no way to find that out. Like they redacted everything in the FOIA. Like, let me introduce you to sec.gov. <laughs> where it's all information from companies all day long and there are you know variations on this all around the world. So again, if you're the kind of person that wants to hold people accountable, following money is a really good and useful way of doing that that I think is often underestimated when people are trying to do you know accountability based journalism, even investigative journalism. I worked at BuzzFeed News for a while and one of my favorite things about them was that in addition to, you know, like really cloak and dagger investigative journalism stuff, they would just get in rooms and stare at spreadsheets for like days at a time and try to figure out what it meant that, you know, this thing over here was moving money over here and these entities were domiciled in places in the Bahamas and like, how do you trace them back? And that's like not glamorous, it's not, you know, a stakeout, it's not door knocking, but it is equally and in some cases even more important um, work when it comes to trying to hold people accountable, especially because corporations, particularly in the aftermath in the US of you know various key pieces of, of rulings and legislation, have a tremendous amount of power. They have economic power, they have environmental Power, right? If you um, have been following the news, whether about, well, let's just pick like Philadelphia, right? Like the fact that they are now under a bottled water warning because of a recent spill of chemicals, um, that's going to be many, many people affected and probably a fine for the company involved there, right? So when you have these very large companies, when you have these corporations that have the ability to make consequential decisions, that affect the lives of tens of thousands and sometimes millions of people, then often accountability journalism is just like figuring out how that company works and who their shareholders are and who their chief executive officer is. And to even get to, getting to be interested in that requires seeing and understanding power differently. The subtitle of this presentation is like, it's about money and power. And I think that power dynamics in media is something that can make us very uncomfortable to discuss, right? But all, all newsrooms are hierarchies. All newsrooms have like decision making trees, who gets to make the last call, who can kill a story, who can unkill a story, like, and they are informed by the experiences of the people in power. There's a stat that I'll share at the end of the presentation, but this is like a, a teaser, which is that in, as of a couple of years ago, the latest data I could find from Pew Research, something like 85% of people in newsrooms over 50 were white men. And people in newsrooms who are over 50 tend to be the editors, the newsroom leaders, the decision makers. And so their perspective on what is and is not the story and like whether you should care about upscale prices is you know a, a big driving determinant of what counts as a story, and you know several years ago, um, Wesley Lowry among others started this conversation about what counts as objectivity in journalism, and Marty Barron, who is on the same journalism school board as I am, recently published a, an op-ed in the Washington Post, you know, kind of making the case for how he thinks about ob objectivity. And one of the things that came out of that conversation was actually less a conversation about objectivity and more con conversation about like neutrality, right? Like what is, what is the default perspective and whose is the default perspective? This is a quote I use so much and my team is like sick of hearing me say it. Um, it was like, who exactly do we mean when we say we? And this is by Janine Desmond Harris, who was writing in Neiman Lab in, in 2018. And Janine, is fantastic and now has like a brilliant opinion column at Slate um, and used to work at Vox Media and various other things. And it's just like a spicy character on Twitter. Um, very interesting. And, you know, kicked off this whole conversation about like, well, we don't think that's a story. I'm like, well, who is the we 
that we're talking about here, or you know, our readers. I'm like, who are these readers? Like, who is the assumed reader who only cares about Jamaica in the context of like reggae music and sandals, right? Because like that is not my Jamaica reader. Like my Jamaica reader are the people who live there. Um, which may not be your audience, but like that's where we have to have a conversation about the difference between implicit and implicit assumptions and like ex explicit behaviors. And so this idea of objectivity and ideology and how it relates to power plays out a lot in the perspective of business and financial reporting. So let's talk about inflation and unemployment for a second, because it's probably the biggest economic story in the entire world, and certainly in the United States. Right now, the United States is trying to figure out how to lower the rate of inflation. And inflation refers to a kind of a sustained increase in the prices of everyday goods and services, right? So not just like one particular food group that is getting more expensive, but kind of across the board, across a basket of goods, that's supposed to represent, you know, the average grocery cart um, purchased by a consumer in the United States. Prices in the U.S. have been significantly rising for a while, and there are many different schools of thought over why that is. And because there are many different schools of thought over why that is, there are disagreements over the right policy approach to tackle inflation. But inflation, as told by the like default business press is a story about rising prices, it's a story about the value of money, it's a story about the appreciation of the US dollar versus the pound sterling or the euro or the yen, it's a story about what the US Federal Reserve is going to do or the Bank of England is going to do, but inflation is much more fundamentally a story about people. Can people afford to buy food? To buy food? Can they afford to replace their cars if they are not in living somewhere that has good public transportation? Can they afford childcare? Um, can they afford healthcare, right? If, if prices across the entire economy are rising, what are the consequences for people? And there are generally fewer stories about the effect of inflation on people than there are stories about just like prices as a sort of this abstract concept, so like it's up like nine and a half percent year on year or whatever that thing is. And part of the reason why is that a lot of business journalists don't have to think about prices in the same way as someone who is living on $28,000 a year. And so the notion that a basket of goods or a bag of groceries is 10% more expensive than it was a year ago is to them abstract versus you are standing in a grocery and you have to now choose between, you know, the Cheerios and the like, Kirkland version of the cereal, or whether you can afford to buy the entire gallon of milk or you're sizing down, whether you buy any fruit or you're buying canned goods only. Those are very different ways of like seeing and experiencing the world. And there are just fewer people working in business media who have had to make those kinds of choices recently or ever in some cases. So this idea of um, the default and this idea of this is what a business journalism story looks like, or this idea of these are the kinds of things that we think are stories for us, is a contestable notion. It might not be contested in your newsroom. Your newsroom is like, this is what we care about, and you work for them, so that's what you care about. Um, but it is a contestable notion in that you should be interrogating it all the time. And you should be interrogating your own stories all the time around whose voices and whose perspectives are represented in them. So in another 
um, version of this presentation when I share this stat, which is, again, from Pew Research 2018, you know, 77% of newsroom employees defined as like reporters, editors, photographers, videographers, working for what would traditionally be defined as a media organization, including broadcast and digital, are non-Hispanic whites, right? And then that number goes to 85% above the age of 50. This number is higher than like you know jobs in the rest of the population. So you know across the United States, I think it's like 65% of U.S. workers are non-Hispanic whites, but 77% of media workers in the United States are non-Hispanic whites. So like our profession skews whiter and more male at the highest levels, especially than is typical of other industries. And there are pockets of journalism, primarily investigative and business that are even more white and more male than any of the other averages. And part of the reason when I like talk to people about this has to do with precedent, right? In in most media organizations, like investigative journalism is like for the superstars, it's like where you have to be like headhunted in the middle of the night, like somebody taps on your shoulder and you join the investigation team, you have no idea how to get on it otherwise. Um, and so it tends to feel like very clubby and very isolated and very isolating. Um, it's often a place where folks are like, we're looking for these highly specialist skills. Like, are you really good at data journalism? Are you really good at misinformation research? Um, which are things that are not necessarily taught to everybody at the same level. And then with business journalism, there's kind of similar degrees of inaccessibility, but the inaccessibility often comes from people opting out. In, in the sense of they're like, oh no no, money like that's not that's not my thing. Like I don't I don't understand business. Um, I don't understand finance. I don't understand economics. I don't understand budgets. I'm like, if you can do arithmetic and you can read, you can be a business journalism. Like the bar is low, right? <laughs> like in everything else, folks will teach you. Um, you know, you're not doing like advanced geometric progression, linear algebra, like, no. <laughs> you're like, does this add up to this profit number over here? Fantastic. Let me just put this in a calculator and confirm. Um, but similar to, you know, the experience that I had in LFE, where I'm like, oh, no, 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 they are not just rich, they are wealthy. Like, there's, a, there's kind of a similar bar that folks thinking about business journalism face where they're like, this is not for me. This is not something that I would know where to start. Like, I can't interview a CEO. Like, what is that like? Um, and so, you know, the gauntlet that I want to throw down is, first of all, you absolutely can. But more importantly, you absolutely have to. Because the absence of perspectives of people who are asking questions like, do you understand how you know, the prices that you are raising is affecting people on fixed incomes means that those folks never get the megaphone that we can otherwise provide. And because those folks never get the megaphone, there is no ability to influence policy and policy discussions about how people are being harmed. Elizabeth Warren, who may or may not be known to various of you, but when I was first a finance reporter, I was covering the financial crisis in 2008. So I graduated into a, um, what is called a bull market. All prices were going up. Everything is great. House prices could never fall. It was literally impossible. And then house prices super did fall. The, you know, the economy slowed down considerably. Multiple banks needed to be mailed out. It was just a bad time. Great time to be in business journalism, bad time for everybody else. And so I was in this weird situation where like my friends and family back home were experiencing like local versions of bank loans. You know, they were like, hey, we had our money in so-and-so bank. Um, it doesn't look like this bank is going to be okay. I'm like, huh, <laughs> uh, this is something I am writing about right now in a way that like felt abstract to me. But now it's, you know, my cousins are saying, they are not sure if they're going to get their money back. Like, what does this mean? They were trying, you know, and so the, again, that sort of, that perspective and that presence allowed me to change the way when I would write about um, mortgages and assets backed by mortgages. So I covered uh, an area of finance known as structured finance and securitization, as well as credit default swap. 
which is essentially like the financial engineering that turns someone's house into a tradable financial asset. And those tradable financial assets were very much at the heart of a lot of the stuff that started to go very pear-shaped in 2008. And it reminded me that behind every one of those tradable financial assets is somebody losing the place that they live. And that my coverage could not live entirely at the level of, you know, Lehman Brothers is trying to figure out how to manage the risk on its portfolio of these things. And it also had to talk about you know, these are the families who were given um, what were sometimes derogatorily known as like ninja loans, like no income, no job, and you like just sign on the you sign on the dotted line. You don't do any kind of verification. Um, persuaded to sign on the dotted line for products that you know had adjustable interest rates or uh, what are sometimes called balloon payments. So you you end up you're only ever paying down the interest. You're never actually paying down the principal and other things that were decently predatory. And I had to kind of just figure out for myself, I was like, how can I make sure that I'm not only focusing on the Lehman Brothers of the world and that wherever I can and however I can, I tie this back to the fact that people are losing hope. So Elizabeth Warren, at the time, um, you know, the Obama administration was trying to figure out like what to do. And one of the things that came out of that was something called the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, which at its height was supposed to make it much harder for financial institutions to take advantage of people. So much harder for payday lenders to, you know, charge interest rates of effectively 100% in, you know, so that people who didn't have access to banks could cash their paychecks. Um, make it make it much harder for your bank to charge you um, some extortionate overdraft penalty, and then have that overdraft penalty like keep you in overdraft, and you sort of keep you know piling up the fees and never being able to get out of it. And what they did was they provided phone numbers. They were like, call us if you think your financial institution is screwing you in some way, and they had the power of the government to go after those folks. And it was a very interesting time because. Suddenly, the ability of large, extremely profitable financial institutions to monetize people on lower incomes was affected. And part of the reason that that happened was because of coverage, and like none of this is new, I was busy writing about Lehman Brothers, um, of people who had spent quite a long time doing business journalism about payday lenders and predatory lending and you know people who they had a mortgage, they thought they had a mortgage with so and so company, but so and so company sold their mortgage to somebody else. And so they could never get anybody on the phone to try to refinance or they would, um, the company that bought it wouldn't have their updated address. So they would be sending them bills and they wouldn't be getting them. And all of a sudden they would be in foreclosure and they couldn't understand how that happened because they thought they were up to date on loan. Like a lot of very bad stuff was happening. It happened all the time back. It was very much happening in kind of 2008, 2009. And a lot of the reason that these policies were able to come through was because of journalism, right? And like the people who were writing stories about how bad and unfair this is. And there continues to be a tradition of that. Uh, there's a woman named Michelle Singletary at the Washington Post. She is a personal finance columnist. She is probably one of the best journalists of her generation who really writes for people who care about the 10% increase in prices and helps like individuals will give individual advice, um, you know, does a lot of journalism about how to think about affordability and whether you can actually afford to take out a certain kind of loan. There are folks who have, there are folks who covered the buy now, pay later companies like Affirm and Klarna from the perspective of like, check out these really hot startups. And then there are people who cover those companies from the perspective of this is what you need to understand. This is debt. You know, it is divided into these four payments this way because it means those companies don't have to register as a certain type of financial services company, which means they have less regulation, which means if you have a dispute with any of them, it's actually harder for you to resolve that kind of dispute because they are not subject to the same rules and regulations of everybody else. 
both of those are totally valid and legitimate business journalism stories. But there are way more people writing about like the buzzy hot startup valuation and who the venture capitalists are and like how this is democratizing finance or whatever the phrases that people use versus the people who are writing about before you spend eight hundred dollars on Sephora um, and you split it into four payments, like this is what you need to understand. I'm not judging anyone who has spent eight hundred dollars on Sephora, shout out to anyone who's VIB Rouge, I understand. Um, but, <laughs> but like this is a real thing. And, you know, I cover crypto, so I run the global coverage of cryptocurrencies for Bloomberg, and a lot of the rhetoric around crypto is framed in this idea of, like, financial inclusion. Like, this is really good for people who are unbanked or underbanked. Like, you can buy Bitcoin, and, you know, that's a, a potentially appreciating asset, and, like, people have a conversation with me all the time, and sometimes I'll get press releases from folks who are like, this is really great for, you know, black people or Latinx people or Hispanic people. And I'm like, why? Um, tell me why this is great. And, you know, the answer will be like, well, underbanked. And they're like, okay, first of all, and I think a lot about what, when I was covering subprime mortgages, it is absolutely true that there are large populations of people, not just in the United States, but around the world, who are cut out of banking services. And when you are cut out of banking services, your life gets more expensive. Because every single time you have to do any kind of financial tra transaction, you have two types of increased costs. You have financial costs and you have time costs, right? A wealthy person can call their bank and be like, hey, I have a payment going out today and I have another one coming in tomorrow. There might be an overlap, but like, you know, it's cool. And their personal banker will be like, totally fine. We'll handle it. We'll make sure that your payment doesn't get affected. A person who is not wealthy, first of all, does not have an individual line to a direct banker. And two, we'll just get hit with over, overdraft fees. Or they will have to line up in a branch for a very long time to try to get to a manager or somebody else who can talk to them if they have a bank account at all. And if they don't have a bank account, then they're, you know, they may have a prepaid debit card, which every time you use it, there's a fee. Or if you try to, you know, withdraw money from an ATM, there's a fee because you're, you are like withdrawing money from a 7-Eleven ATM as opposed to a city bank. And so being unbanked or underbanked is very expensive, and that is a burden placed on people who are already who already tend to be on fixed or lower incomes and who don't have the flexibility to absorb three dollars in fees when they want to withdraw when they want to withdraw ten dollars at a time. So that they will be like, well, this is better for them. And they're like, okay. However, crypto is one of the single most volatile asset classes in the entire world. And all that means is that prices go up, the prices also go down, and they can go up and they can go down very quickly. And often with not a lot of what we in business world and sometimes describe as like fundamentals, basically means like we have no idea why. Um, why is this going up today? Why is it going down today? Very unclear. And so it is an incredibly risky asset class because it is an asset class that at any moment can go to zero in a way that is very different from if you own equities in the largest company, you know, shares in the largest companies in the world, or you have like US government bonds. Like there are people who think the US government is going to default on its debt, but if it does, like the world is basically over. It's like nuclear war. And so, you know, the, the level of risk of buying US government debt versus buying one Bitcoin is a universe apart. But many more people are advertised Bitcoin than are advertised buying US government debt. So the people who tend to get told, hey, you should put money in US government debt, probably have like a spare $250,000 just lying around. And they're like, oh yeah, that seems great. Um, and your average person who is buying Bitcoin has not ever fathomed having $10,000 lying around, much less $250,000. And you saw a version of this around you know, people who have wealth and have the, the flexibility to make certain kinds of decisions in the past few weeks where you had a lot of runs on banks. So Silicon Valley Bank, the key is in the name, it served venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, startups, mostly based in Southern California, in Northern California, um, lost the confidence of its largest depositors, who are those same entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, etc. And they spent like two, three days like, freaking out on Twitter, being like, oh, this is the worst, blah, blah, blah. Now, the thing is, in the aftermath of 2008, one of the things the U.S. government got very good at is making sure the banks don't fail. Or at least that they don't fail in unstructured 
ways, right? If there is a bank failure, there is a plan. And so on Signature Bank, which is another another um, bank that no longer exists in the same form, failed on like a Sunday and on Monday morning it opened for business and they have like a new sign, a new management, and they're like, cool, everybody still has their money, everything's great. Because one of the lessons they learned in 2008 is like, if you have bank failure, people are going to get really mad and then you lose the next lesson. And so not not having bank failures is kind of like a key, a key policy thing, but a couple of unprecedented things happened with Silicon Valley Bank, which is instead of the government who of something that's known as um, the FDIC, like the Federal Deposit Insurance Corps, guaranteeing that if you have up to $250,000 in your bank, if anything happens to our bank, you're going to get that money back. The government will pay you. They were like, any amount. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter how much money you have in here, you will get that money back if for any reason the bank is unable to pay you. And for some people, that was millions of dollars, right? And so the government was prepared to take steps to say, no matter how much money you have, we are going to make sure that you are fine. And then they did that for multiple other banks. And again, like the rich people stopped complaining on Twitter and they went back to like backing the Biden administration and saying it's the worst of all time. So, you know, order was restored in the universe. But a lot of other people were like, hang on a minute. You know, well, how do you even have so much money that you have to worry that $250,000 of deposit insurance is not enough? Because that is not the, like, the reality for the vast majority of people in the world, much less the United States. And so all of the very, very, very good business journalism that happened, that happened over those days and weeks and endlessly long weekends, you know, didn't really interrogate the question of like, who are those financial services really for? Because that's a totally different question. Like, you had teams of reporters and editors who were very talented and very good at my job at their jobs, including some of my excellent colleagues, making sure that, you know, the types of people who probably have more than $250,000 understood what was at stake making sure that politicians and central bankers and other people who were making decisions understood like what was at stake around the world. But there is, again, much less journalism about who is taking unprecedented action in the wee hours of the morning on a Sunday to think about like people who have student loan debt or people who have, you know, significant other types of financial challenges that no one is really solving a problem for in a non-predatory way. I feel like I finally understand what's been happening with the banking situation. It is this is just mind blowing to me. Uh, uh, are you? Are there any more slides? No. Nope. Okay. So why don't you join me here because I, I really want us to um, unpack this a little bit while we have you here and while we can benefit from this. The one question before I get to any of yours is, when I think of President Biden's um, push to have the chip makers provide childcare, mm -hmm. and I look around the country and I'm thinking about these things because I'm planning for another child well-being fellowship in, in May, but other companies and other organizations really sort of advocating for that. I'm fascinated because I feel like that's a, that's a finance story. Oh, that's a money story. Yeah. Talk to us about how we can sort of look at these kinds of issues. You already have, but talk about that issue, for example. What it takes to get policy changed or elevated at that level. Yeah. So one of the interesting things about the intersection of business finance and economics is if, it, if you're big enough, ultimately, it's a political question. And the reason that I say that is because governments are always very interested in how the economy works. And depending on the kind of government, the kind of economy, the country that you're talking about, it may be because they want to control how the economy works. It may be because they want to have a more hands-off approach to how the economy works, and I'm not going to use any of the jargon around like where on the political spectrum that tends to line because it's not as neat as people like to make it out to be. Because there will be people who can be 
extremely interventionist in one sector and then relatively hands off in another. Um, I'll give an example. So in, in France, for example, there is something called, there's a concept of a national champion, which is a domestic company that is considered to be so important to the local economy that they can be protected from competition in ways that the broader European Union might not be like dead keen on allowing, because the whole idea of the European Union is supposed to be like the free movement of mostly goods, clearly not people. And the um, and in and yet you sort of you have this idea of certain states wanting to protect certain types of industries. So for a while in Detroit, local politicians were very motivated to protect automakers. In Texas, local politicians are very motivated to protect oil and gas companies against what they might see as the incursion of federal policy or international policy in some way, shape, or form. So politicians at the local, state, and federal level are always thinking about money, like all the time, not just like their personal fundraising, but also how is the economy working and for whom? And so in the case of childcare and chip makers, it's super interesting because chip makers are very sensitive to international agreements about import-export. They're very sensitive to lots of different parts of the supply chain. They're very sensitive to taxes on those imports and exports, all of which are things generally controlled or highly influenced by government. And so there are certain industries who, like, if a certain politician suggests <laughs> that they should do a thing, they're like, ha, huh, yes, you control these nine out of the ten things that we need to work. We will agree that this is a good suggestion that we should follow. And there are other times when they're like, we don't care. We can't do shit. <laughs> and that happens too. So, you know, I think the question when you're looking at these stories is always like, what what does a thing, like if there's an entity that makes money, how are they making money? And like, what is the literal supply chain that goes into their ability to do that? You know, so, I mean, you should ask this of your own users, because nobody should ever be surprised by layoffs. If you are a good journalist, you should be able to see them coming, because you should interrogate the business models of the places that you work with the same kind of curiosity and bloody-mindedness um, that you use for any other kind of story that you are reporting on. And so if you work for a place that is a nonprofit and it has like two big donors and you didn't hear that those donors renewed recently, you shouldn't be surprised, right? You should, you know, if you are, if you work for a place that is extremely dependent on advertising revenue and you look around and every single tech company in the world, like our advertising revenue is down like 82%, you're like, huh, I would fairly extrapolate <laughs> that we are probably affected by the same trends here. And so just like taking five minutes to ask the question, what are the inputs and what are the outputs and how much do these things cost and where do they come from is a great source of stories around the world. I thought of another uh, finance story about the Wisconsin lawmaker who said, I don't think we need free lunch because I don't know anybody who, in Wisconsin who's hungry. Uh, this yeah. is how I think we need to be thinking about new ways to cover money. Did you yeah. hear that? Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Jarrell Arvin from Vox.com. Um, so I wanted to ask about sort of like the appetite for these stories that provide a megaphone to like communities that need one. Um, do you think that there is an appetite for that type of journalism in like the business field? And then also like, how do we access it if we were to want to actually cover it? Um, I mean, I think the first thing is to look around your newsroom and look at what the priorities are and then figure out how you can draft in those priorities by but bring a, a different perspective for them, right? So we, there are some very good, there are two reporters in Bloomberg who cover video games, um, which is a job I did not know you could have. And I'm like, I have been questioning my life choices now. <laughs> and, and they they report on video games from the sense of like you know these are some of the largest companies in the world. One of them is one of the biggest games makers in the world, owned by Microsoft. So that that's like a very clear tech story. But they also cover it from the perspective of labor. Um, a lot of video like in the last year and a half, California, for example, sued 
various change makers for having essentially toxic work environments and being, you know, full of racism and sexism and misogyny. And they covered those stories. They're covering stories about like labor and unionization and negotiations, which are all like business journalism things, but applied to a domain that a few years ago people might not have appreciated how big it was. And at least in terms of labor, labor as an element of business journalism has become much larger in the past, I would say, three and definitely five years um, around the world. I mean, you know, half of Europe is on strike literally to be. So I do think that because of the, the what's happening in the economy, like you have a lot of opportunity there, but it is always important when you're pushing anything to frame it in ways that make sense to the existing editorial priorities of your newsroom, especially if it's something that, you know, people have are less conversant in doing. So in uh, 2020, I was the editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune. My first day on the job was March 11th. March 11th was the, basically the beginning of the pandemic in Texas. It was right after they canceled South by Southwest. Um, my first act as editor-in-chief was to try to figure out like how to get PPE to people and like what we were going to do. Um, who made money on PPE? And, but suddenly, we as a newsroom that had never covered unemployment, have to figure out how to cover unemployment. And now, like, I'm fine as journalist, I'm like, yep, okay, I'm going to teach you these two reporters over here how you cover unemployment as a story, because suddenly our readers wanted to know, like, what was happening. But we didn't cover unemployment from the story of, like, just percentages. We covered unemployment as a story of the, the, the line to get through to unemployment benefits, like, nobody would ever answer because they were so understaffed, and, like, what that meant in practice and how people were dealing with it. So I think there's always a way into a story that feels relevant to your readers and that you are you're the ability to do. And in terms of resources, um, there are, for those of you in New York, the Steve Schwartzman Library, the Steve Schwartzman bit of the New York Public Library is basically like their business journalism like playground. And you can go up to any of those librarians and be like, how do I find XYZ? And they will actually tell you. And so if you're not in a newsroom that has like a, a data desk or an economics desk or any of those things, there are lots of resources where you can start. My other favorite exercise, especially if there's something that I don't quite understand, is I'll go to the big, you know, the big websites or whatever, or I'll Google something, and I will read the stories and I'll try to reverse engineer how they put that story together. You know, so if they cite a certain statistic, I'm like, okay, where did they get that statistic from? And I'll Google the statistic and I'll find it. Um, I love footnotes. Uh, you know, when you if you are reading a, a report or anything like that, like always look at footnotes because that's where you'll find a lot of those different types of citations. You, um, your local chamber of commerce, always great people to call. Basically, nobody ever calls them. All they want to do is talk about how great capitalism is all day long. And so, if you know, if you have questions or you think like, hey, I'm really interested in understanding like who are the five big, who are the five biggest, um, you know, businesses in this neighborhood. Like that's the kind of data that they have. And even if you're not necessarily writing that story, it's like a good place to start to get fluent in the language that people use. Other question? Hello, uh, I'm Alexi Horowitz Ghazi. I'm at Planet Money. Um, I'm wondering if someone, uh, it's kind of a related question, but if someone motivated by this desire to widen the pipeline of uh, people covered and kind of economic experiences covered by financial and business journalism. Like, how do you think about the trade-offs uh, between kind of like that motivation and the fact that I think a lot, it feels like a lot of financial and business journalism is kind of like structured within the economic system and is preaching to the kind of converts to capitalism in a way. Like there, there's like a spectrum of kind of uh, more and more technical and esoteric kind of markets and niches that you could cover that speaks to a smaller and spot, smaller audience and it kind of uh, moves away from that towards the people maybe you want to be doing stories about or whose experiences you want to be including. So I'm just wondering how you thought about where to situate yourself or kind of what the levers are that you're trying to impact. In the I would say for me personally, those things are a spectrum that I move along. Right? So like when I started in the journal, I'm not going to and in 2007, like six people in the world, who probably eight on a good day, cared about those instruments, but like three of them were central bankers, um, who are the people that, you know, sort of determined the direction of monetary policy. 
So I was I was writing for a very 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 small, extremely specialist universe of people, and then like three years later, way more people cared about trying to pull up because they were helping to build the economy, etc. Um, but at the same time that I was doing those stories, I was also writing a story about you know uh, like a family that had experienced um, generational housing scarcity and how they were experiencing like foreclosure. So, you know, I think for me it's that I I have the ability to write about a lot of different things. And the fact that I can understand really esoteric bits of finance makes my general finance writing better. Because I, I know where to look, I know what kinds of questions to ask. You know, and so I see it as sort of complementary skills. It's like this this thing that gives me the ability to stare at columns of numbers in red and green on a Bloomberg terminal and translate that into 500 words that hopefully more than eight people will read. Um, it's just a muscle that you have to develop in the same way that, you know, when the pandemic hit, very many people in a newsroom have to figure out how to be a health reporter. And like, that is not easy. You don't go from like zero to epidemiology <laughs> um, just because there's a pandemic. You know, it, you have to learn a, a completely different universe of things and you have to like get a sense of interpreting data and risk and thresholds and just you know things that may not have been your real health before and so for me it's like there is the baseline of competency and capability and then there's a range of what i want to be using that on and i have been very fortunate because it goes back to the like it's thing i've worked in different types of places and so that has given me the ability to tell completely different types of stories, but also within the same newsrooms, I have tried to like be who I am in my stories. So when I was covering White Collar Crime, one of the stories that I covered was about the dude named Alan Stanford, who um, was eventually found guilty of defrauding a bunch of people, and he was based out of Antigua. And I flew to Antigua and spent like a week and a half there. And then I was able to write a story that didn't start from the like tourist trappy you know, cruise ship economy kind of thing, but like had real reporting about the people who had been affected and the politicians who enabled this kind of behavior. Because I was coming at it from a person who like lived in an economy like this and knew what I would care about if this dude who owned multiple restaurants, did one of the newspapers on the island, you know, sponsored like the cricket tournament, which was like big in the Caribbean, um, and various things like that was suddenly in jail. So, you know, I think that if you as a person care about stuff, part of the key is to figure out how you can use the tools around you to sort of represent your personality in in the work that you are doing. Unless there are any more burning questions. <laughs> we'll take one more then. No because problem. that was a perfect uh, end point for me. Okay, all right. Well, let's go to you. you have a story. Okay, this isn't um, long. I am Princess. I'm a reporter with the Milwaukee Neighborhood News yeah. Service. Um, I cover housing, so I'm wondering how you balance sometimes telling a financial story with the people that sometimes telling that story will affect. So, like, if I want to do a story looking at like how the city's housing authority is mismanaging money, then I will also have to mention that like how that's mi that mismanagement is leading to like infestation in the mm -hmm. properties that they own. But then I like out all of those tenants kind of to the rest of the city. So, like, how do you balance telling that story and being mindful of the people that? It will affect. I think whenever you're reporting for on on and about like vulnerable people, you have to think. You always think about how would they tell the story about themselves. And so, I, I think sometimes reporters make assumptions that, like, we either know the best way or we shouldn't. And what I always try to do is ask. So one of the things I learned in when I moved to Texas is there's a very different universe of people who are like used to having the FT call them up. Um, than people who are just like, I'm unemployed and I've emailed you because you're the Texas Tribune and I think you could help me. And so saying to them, hey, this is on the record, this is off the record, is like a meaningless sentence because they have no concept of what those things are because why should they? They're normal human beings. You know, like a PR agent. And so I, I try to think about, okay, what do I have to help this person understand about what is going to happen if I write this? And so, you know, and I tried to like two stuff my reporters. I, they would say like, "Oh yeah, we photographed so and so." I'm like, did you tell them? Did you ask them? Are there kids? Are there kids in this picture? Do their parents know how big our distribution is? Like, do they understand that their name is going to be in this headline? 
right? And I don't see those things as like compromising us journalistically. I see those things as like the baseline of ethical reporting. Because there are all there are always lots of different ways to tell a story and to be effective and to be accurate and to be fair without necessarily having to include either every detail or no detail. Um, but it, 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 very, it is very much like situational, right? Because there are going to be people who say like, yep, totally 100%, and the second you call the trade, they're going to call and be like, you need to correct this. <laughs> I did not give permission to do X, Y, and Z. That's going to happen. But I think the mere fact of you thinking about that question is a good sign, right? And, like, and I think the next step is to try to be having these conversations with people. And the last thing I would say is that not every story has to do everything. Right, so you, you don't you don't have to think about like every every story is not your last chance to to tell a particular story. Every story is like a chance to to tell a particular story, and so if you can't like fix everything, or you know you have two leads, <laughs> that's usually a sign that you should break things out and see if you can figure out other ways. In. So many takeaways, sorry, uh, that uh, we have from this conversation. But the good news is, again, it will be the video will be posted. And I'm sure Stacy will be open to hearing from you, but yeah. I just want to share my key takeaway. Having a weirdly high tolerance for risk can turn you into an extraordinary journalist like Stacy Marie Ishmael. Thank you so much for joining us.